And the people said? Wow. Thank you, Cindy, for letting your voice be a channel of God's grace. Well, happy Sabbath, church. Um, as I get myself set up here, I want to bring you greetings from the Medrano family. You guys remember the Medranos? Uh, I was able to get in touch with them uh, all the way in Germany. And uh, they send their love. Uh, they miss us. It's always nice when somebody misses us. Amen? So they really miss us, and they uh, send their greetings. They found the church right on base, uh, not far from Frankfurt, where they're worshiping every Sabbath. They're having an awesome time, and they just con they told me to convey their greetings and their love to the rest of the church family. So I uh, just wanted to let you know that all the way in Europe, people are thinking about our church family. That's encouraging. Let's keep them in prayer. This morning, we have an exciting new series that we're going to be kicking off. Um, yeah, I think, we're, I think we're good. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. What is this, some kind of like a sci-fi? Uh, what is this, a sci-fi documentary, a sci-fi movie? No, it is not a sci-fi documentary, so you can relax. <laughs> but our series, we're going to be launching a new series and the series is called Alien Righteousness. Alien Righteousness. And it's really based, the entire series is going to be based on the book of Romans. Now, some of you are thinking, why in the world are we doing the book of Romans? Our Sabbath school is on the book of Galatians. Isn't that double dipping? Maybe. Maybe it's double dipping. But there's a lot of reasons why we have decided to go the route of the book of Romans. One of those reasons is because 2017 is a very special year. Uh, maybe those of you that aren't history buffs, um, 2017 is an important year because it's, it commemorates the 500 years since the spark of the Protestant Reformation. Did you know that? This fall, or really this October, to be to be very accurate, the end of October is, will be the 500-year anniversary since October 31, 1517, when Martin Luther took the 95 Thesis and he nailed it on the church there in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, why are we commemorating the Protestant Reformation? Well, because we are indebted to the work of Martin Luther. Amen? We are indebted to the work of the Protestant Reformation. Now, we're not really going to get, this is not really going to be a history. We're not going to be dealing into the history of the Reformation. What we're interested in this series is what led to the Reformation. There's enough material out there about the Reformation that you can read. My highest recommendation, my greatest recommendation on the work of the Reformation is written by a little old lady. Her name was Ellen G. White. Have you ever heard of Ellen G. White? She wrote a book called The Great Controversy. Anybody read the, the, the book Great Controversy? Have you heard of the book Great Controversy? Do yourself a favor. This uh, fall, I want to challenge everybody to pick up The Great Controversy and read. You don't have to read the whole thing. It's quite the undertaking. It took me, right after I was baptized, it took me a solid year to get through the whole Great Controversy. That was a rough year because I wasn't used to the, the whole reading thing. It was, it was a new experience for me. It took me a good year. Pick out the chapters that deal, start with John Wycliffe, and go all the way through to William Miller. You're going to be so incredibly blessed. But what, what you're going to find is awesome details about the life of Martin Luther and what led to the Reformation. So that's the justification as to why we're dedicating so much time and why we're choosing uh, the book of Romans. Because the book of Romans is what led to the amplification of the Protestant Reformation, of which we're connected to. The Adventist Church and our history, if you trace it all the way back, we're connected through the Protestant Reformation. So really, it's kind of going back to our heritage. It's going to back where we come from. And one of the fascinating things is that it's very easy to lose sight of where we come from. And that's always dangerous. Whenever we lose track of where we come from and our lineage, 
it creates a lot of problems. And that's one of the things that we saw, what, what we see through the experience of Israel. They lost where they came from, and because of that, they pretty much um, had some issues because of that. So that's the justification. We're going to be focusing on the book of Romans. It's going to be a good time to connect back to the Protestant Reformation. Uh, please pick up the Great Controversy and read the chapter, The Diet of Arms, Luther's Separation from Rome. You're going to be so challenged. You're going to be so inspired. And I think it's going to definitely coincide with what we're talking about. So that's one of the reasons. That's one of the reasons why we're talking about the book of Romans. Another reason is because we have a problem. And when I say we, I don't necessarily mean our local church. I mean the church in general. I mean, and I'm not even talking about our denomination. I'm talking about all Christian denominations. We have a problem. And that problem, we're going to address in a minute here, but the problem is a, 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 a lack of concentrating on Christ. Amen? Which is kind of a little weird if you think about it. Because if you go to the church, the church, of course, is the body of who? Christ. So if you go to the church, what should be proclaimed? Christ. What should you see? Christ. What should you hear? Christ. But unfortunately, there's a crisis in many churches, and that is that we've deviated from Christ, and we've got into a lot of other stuff, which isn't bad stuff. It's just the emphasis has shifted, and that creates a lot of dysfunctions. We're going to talk about that. Can we talk about that, church? Can we, can we be open with each other? We're going to address that, and we're also going to talk a little bit about the issues um, that come with that. When we deviate from the person of Christ, we tend to forget what the values are. If I go to a, if I go to a, oh, I don't know, to an em, a German embassy, right? I'm going to be exposed to things from where? Germany. If I go to an Australian embassy, right? I mean, obviously, you, you, get the, you get the point. If we come to the church, we should be overly saturated. Not with things or with cultural traditional hang-ups, amen? But we should be oversaturated with what? We should be overwhelmed. That's what we should be. So throughout the years, we have deviated from that. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So anyways, there, and, there's, and by the way, there's a lot of other, other reasons, but these are the two major reasons. Number one, Protestant Reformation, a 500-year anniversary this fall. Number two, because we desperately need to reconfigure the way we do, not only the way we do church, but the way that we approach God. We need to reconfigure ourselves. We constantly need to reboot and we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Now, Martin Luther, as I mentioned, is the, the kind of the main, he's not the only person responsible for the Protestant Reformation. In fact, if you read the Great Controversy, we're told that there was a, several people before Martin Luther that were paving the way for the Protestant Reformation, one of which was known the, as the morning star of the Reformation. Anybody know who that was? He's actually from England, John Wycliffe. So the work of John Wycliffe came before Martin Luther, but he was kind of sowing the seeds, sowing the seeds, sowing the seeds. And then later on, centuries later, when Martin Luther came into the scene, that's when the harvest came about. And Martin Luther, of course, uh, uh, was an was a, was a, uh, element of bringing a step forward to Bible truth. It doesn't necessarily mean that Martin Luther had it all together. So I think, I think we understand each other when we talk about that. But where do we get this idea of alien righteousness? Like, what's the deal? That's kind of a weird concept. Well, I can't take credit for that title. I can't take credit for that, um, that expression. It actually comes from Martin Luther. He invented it. It wasn't me. I'm just kind of using that expression to kind of be the umbrella of what we're going to be talking about. What is Alien Righteousness, and why is our series titled Alien Righteousness? I'm so glad you asked that question, okay? If you look at the screen, Martin Luther wrote, Alien Righteousness, that is the righteousness of who? Of another, instilled from where? From without. This is what? The righteousness of Christ by which he justifies through faith. You see that? 
So the idea of alien righteousness is very simple. It's a foreign righteousness. It's a strange righteousness. It's an external righteousness, which leads us to the conclusion that we cannot produce this righteousness. Are you comfortable with that? That's the whole idea. That's what, that's what Martin Luther was saying. He was basically saying that our salvation comes from something foreign, from th- something from out of this world. And if you look carefully at the gospel story, that's exactly what it is. It's this divine being who came from the other side of the cosmos, which in a reverent manner we can refer to as alien, of course, with all the respect that we could because when we think of alien, we think of all kinds of stuff that unfortunately Hollywood has influenced us with. But it's not a bad word. It just means foreign. So Christ is the alien that brings righteousness to this unrighteous world. That's really, what, that's really where the concept comes from. And we're going to do the best that we can to glean and to dig deeper because there's a lot of stuff that we have to benefit from. Listen to what Ellen G. White wrote in the book Faith and Works. Now, this is unbelievable, okay? Listen to what she wrote. She wrote, there is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon, listen carefully, more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all, dot, dot, dot. So she's prefacing what she's going to say. And she's basically saying that there is no other thing that is worthy of the time, of the repetition, of the attention, of the memorization, and you fill in the blanks. There's nothing else more worthy of this next idea that is worthy of repetition, that's worthy of being established more firmly and more frequently in the minds of people. Now, some of you are thinking, the sanctuary message. Praise the Lord for the sanctuary message, amen? It's a beautiful message. And if you want to learn about the sanctuary, come Wednesday nights. We're getting into the sanctuary, and it's pretty off the hook what we're learning. Is it the three angels' message? Is it the, the Ten Commandments? Is it, what is it? Well, she says that, let me read it from the beginning, there is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all, then the impossibility, listen, The impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Whoa. She says, listen, if you want to scratch the disc at the right place, this is where you want to scratch it. Scratch it in the sense of, you know, when you scratch a disc, it kind of repeats. Maybe we don't do CDs anymore, so it goes to show the generation that I come from, right? But that's the idea is that when the disc is scratched and it repeats, it repeats, it repeats. She says there is no other truth, no other concept, no other teaching more worthy of repetition than the fact that it is impossible for man by his own good works to merit anything because salvation is only through Jesus Christ alone. Now, some of you are thinking, well, Duh, <laughs> right? That is such, that is so elementary. That is so kindergarten. And you're right. It is. It's very kindergarten. It's very basic. But for some funny reason, even though it's very foundational, we always lose sight of it. We always forget about it. And that's what breeds a lot of very dis- distorted dysfunctions. Now, listen to what she says. She continues. She continues, ladies and gentlemen. Review and Herald, March 11, 1890. Listen to what she says. And she's talking about us. Amen? She's referring to the Advent people. Listen to what she says. She says, quote, as a people, we have preached what? The law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. What's the solution? We must preach Christ in the law. Amen? This is, this is in Spanish, we, we, we call her, in an endearing term, we call her la viejita. That's what we refer to as Ellen G. White, la viejita. So, you know, in English it doesn't work very well, so I won't say it. the little old lady. It doesn't really work very well. But this is, this, is our, this is our pioneer of the Advent movement, and she says that we have done a lot of damage. Because we have emphasized our message in the wrong place. 
She says that we have emphasized the law so much that we have dehydrated God, the people. We have dehydrated them. And it says, it says there's no dew or rain. Well, there's a problem. Because if there's no dew or rain, guess what? There's no fruit. <laughs> right? You need fruit in order to actually, in order to have fruit, you need rain. You need moisture. So the idea there is that, now she's not, obviously, it would be, it would be amiss to even conclude that she's speaking negatively about the law. Don't misunderstand. She's saying that her emphasis has been inappropriate. If we preach Christ in the law, then that's when the nourishing... In fact, if you, if I, I wish I could put the rest of the quote, but I couldn't. But she talks about how when Christ is in the law, that's when the nourishment comes from. That's when the nourishment. So we're, we're, what we're doing is we're giving ourselves a diagnosis of a, of a problem that we have. One of the things that you'll discover is that a lot of the issues in the church, a lot of the challenges in the church are simply a symptom. Are you comfortable with that? A symptom of a deeper problem. So usually we get ourselves in trouble, you know, we disagree and we kind of argue and we do this and we do that. Well, that person said that, that person said that. But many times we kind of battle each other at the, at the uh, not at the foundational level, we battle ourselves on the, help me out guys, what's the word? Ten, oh, that's good. At the 10,000 foot level. Instead of going to the foundation and the base. I am of the opinion that the biggest issue we have that leads to all of these other stuff is a misunderstanding of how salvation actually works in the believer's hearts. And this is unfortunately has been a people repellent. It's been a people repellent because the Bible tells us that if Christ is lifted up, what's the natural reaction? What happens when we lift up Christ? What does Jesus say? I will draw all men unto me. Well, the math is very, very simple. If we preach Christ, people's hearts are drawn to Christ. They come unto him. If we don't preach Christ, then what happens? The opposite effect occurs. Right? It's a people repellent. So an overemphasis on the law, an overemphasis on rules, an overemphasis on regulations. Now, notice what I'm saying. Overemphasis. I'm not saying that the law and rules and these things are bad. But if they're overemphasized, if emphasizing Jesus, that's a big problem. That is a huge problem because the point of it all, it's about Jesus. So let us make sure that we're not dry as the hills of Gilboa. Now let's talk a little bit about legalism. Can we talk about legalism? Can we talk about it? Actually, we're going to be talking about it quite a bit in this whole series because not because I'm bringing it up, but because the Apostle Paul brought it up, right? What's the problem with legalism? And we're going to get into this uh, further along. So we're not going to do like a huge, exhaustive exposition on legalism. But this is the problem with legalism. Legalism usually, well, first let's define it, and then let's talk about the two major outcomes of legalism. Legalism is this idea that rules and that to-dos is the way that I could actually redeem myself. If I do one, two, and three, then I'm in. Right? Now, at a theological level, none of us really believe that, at a theological level. But for some reason, connecting the theological wires with our emotional, psychological, right, and our daily living, for some reason, we're not, we're not connecting it. We're not connecting because of our experience and the way that we do things. So our idea is to connect and to bridge our theological understanding that it is impossible to following one, two, and three to be redeemed. That's impossible. First of all, it's too late for that. Did you know that? Because after the fall in Genesis chapter three, it's too late. So the idea of, oh, well, if I follow these rules, well, we can't because we already broke the rules. So there's no point. There's no point. Now, if, you were, if we were to have this conversation before Genesis 3, well, then maybe the conversation would go a little different. But it's a little bit too late. We're already under the penalty, right? So this is the problem with legalism. The problem with legalism is that there's multiple problems. 
Because it is based on our works and what we do and what we follow, the natural tendency of legalism is to bring the bar down. Now, why, why do we want to bring it down? Why do we want to bring the bar down? Let, let, me, let me illustrate. Jesus said, you've heard it said unto you, right, that if, you, if, if uh, a man who, who enters into a relationship with, a, with another woman that isn't his wife, he's committed what? Adultery, right? What does Jesus say? But I say unto you that if you look on a woman of what? To lust, you have what? Committed adultery already. So let me ask you a question. Whose level was higher, Jesus or the Pharisees? Jesus was far higher because the Pharisees, they were just focused on the outward, the external. And they wanted to make sure that it was negotiably low. Negotiably. Why? So that they could actually reach it. <laughs> you get the idea? But Jesus wasn't focused on the letter of the law. He was focused on the spirit of the law, which, by the way, is way, is infinitely higher than any professional legalist that you can find. You find a good legalist that's doing everything. At the end of the day, the bar will never be as high as Christ. Why? Because by nature, we want that bar to be as low as possible so that we can actually attain to it. And even then is a miserable experience. Why? Because we're dealing with a fallen nature, right? We're dealing with thousands and thousands of years of degenerated uh, human DNA. So we're wired to rebel. So the problem with legalism is, is, is that it leads to two, two paths. The first path, which led most of the Jews, is... What body language am I giving? Arrogance. Pride. We're all that in a bag of chips, but everybody else is just rotten sinners. They're not as good as we are. You know what I'm talking about, right? This is the problem with legalism. If, you're base, if your religion is based on a systematic behavioral code, that's going to breed arrogance and pride in your own heart. And when it breeds arrogance and pride, unfortunately, arrogance and pride manifests itself by pushing people away rather than embracing them, right? This is the problem. So legalism leads to a, a mentality of arrogance and pride. And that's exactly what, if you remember the, the, the prayer of the Pharisee and the publican, I thank you, God, that I'm not like this guy, right? Classic example. This is one of the outcomes of legalism. The other, the other outcome of legalism is depression. Because here you have a bunch of rules that if you don't keep them, you're not going to be saved. So you constantly try to keep them, and you can't, and you fail, and you fall. And you try to get up, and you do it on your own power, you fail, and you fall. You fail, and you fall. You fail, and you fall after, you know, 120 uh, three times of that, you start getting a little bit annoyed, yeah? And it leads to depression. Why? Because you, you think, well, I'm worthless. Uh, this Christianity stuff is not for me. I'm not as good as the other people. And unfortunately, a lot of people, because of the outcome of a legalistic understanding, have been led to leave the path of, of the cross in the community of faith because they thought that it was based on their performance. And they realized that they kind of, with all due respect, if you could allow me this expression, but they kind of stink at it, right? That's not a theological term, by the way. They stink at it. So they're like, man, I really stink at this thing. This stuff is not for me. I was wired differently. And then you have this big chasm between church people and the rest of humanity. And then meanwhile, the, the, the other person who's celebration. Having a celebration. Why? Because the more people tap out, wave the white flag, the better, what? I guess not everybody's got it, got it like I got it. You follow? So then you have this brother or this sister here who's arrogant and proud because they see the other person experiencing depression. So, a couple more years. A couple more years and you'll get to where I'm at. See the problem? That is grotesquely anti-Christian. 
That is grotesquely anti-Christian. That is the complete diametric opposite of the foundation of what Christ came to establish. And by the way, by the way, if you study carefully in the book of Revelation, this whole anti-Christ power, if you go to the foundations of what makes this power anti-Christian, you want to know what it is? Exactly what we're talking about. Salvation based on works. That is the fundamental problem. So legalism is a big issue, ladies and gentlemen. It's worse than the Ebola. I know we had the Ebola thing in West Africa, and then we had it in Spain and a couple of the... Legalism is a huge disease, and it's actually contagious. And the interesting thing is that the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans is essentially declaring war on legalism. He's declaring war because he realizes that the stakes are very high, and legalism does not take prisoners. Actually, they do... It, it does take prisoners, but you know what I mean. A different type of prisoners. The stakes are very high. This is what Romans is all about. This is what the whole uh, issue that Paul is dealing with is all about. Now, we're talking about the letter to the Romans, which interestingly enough, this is a footnote. But according to the book of Revelation, where would this future end time power emerge from? Interestingly enough, come on, Bible students, where? Rome. Now, we're not going to get into that because we've done enough Revelation seminars, right? So we, we, we're aware of that. The idea there is that Paul is writing a letter to the city of Rome, which was going to be the epicenter of this end-time power established on salvation by works. Coincidence? I don't think so. But this is the point. Rome, sure, it's, all, it's on the other side, right? It's on the Mediterranean. But there's a Rome inside each and every one of us. There's a Roman empire and there's a Roman city inside every heart of man. And what we have here is we have the Apostle Paul. He's working in the Mediterranean. He's establishing churches. He's dealing with legalists. He's trying to encourage them. He's, giving, he's essentially doing legalist therapy. Did you know that? That's what he's doing. He's, he's giving therapy to a bunch of people that, that were erroneously basing their faith on a false system. That's what his ministry primarily worked on. And, of course, he worked primarily with the Gentiles. Now, he's writing from, if you have, um, I don't know, does this have a laser? It doesn't have a laser. So if you look at the map here, and if you see where it says Greece, you'll see another city there called Corinth, okay? Paul was hanging out in Corinth, and he was writing the letter to the Romans from Corinth. And let's talk a little bit about why he was doing that and what, what's the whole point. He was writing to a church that he had never been to. Most of the time when Paul wrote his letters, it was follow-up. He was writing, hey, salute brother so-and-so. Salute brother so-and-so. I've heard that you have done this, but really you should have done that. It's pastoral. A lot of the letters are pastoral guidance. Well, he was writing to the church of Rome. He's never been to Rome. And in his letter, he actually says, listen, it's not because I've been putting it, putting, putting it off. It's just that I've tried and circumstances didn't allow. Right? But he was writing to the city of Rome for multiple reasons. Number one is to introduce himself because he was planning to actually make a stop in Rome. Number one. Number two is because he was wanting to give the Roman believers an understanding of what the gospel was. Now, Paul's letter to the Romans is the most complete gospel treatise, if I could use that term than any other letter. And the reason is simple. He'd never been there. So in the Philippians, in the Ephesians, in the Galatians, he was laboring there. He was teaching, he was instructing, he was training. So there wasn't a need in the letters to get into all the, the idiosyncrasies and all the details and all the foundational nuts and bolts of the gospel because he was there, he labored there. But see, in Rome, he, didn't know, he, he knew people there who eventually moved to Rome, but he had never labored there. So as he was writing the letter to the Romans, he started from ground zero. He says, well, I never worked there, so let me, let me give them a complete picture of what the plan of salvation looks like. And that's why Romans is so awesome. It's because it's so, they actually, some theologians call it the gospel according to Paul. 
That's how powerful it is. And that's why he was writing it. And then number three, the reason why he was writing it is because there was, there was issues in the church, like in all the churches that he established. He was there to give guidance and give understanding. Yeah? So his plan, his uh, itinerary, was to go from Corinth down to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is in the lower right, right there in Jerusalem. And the reason why he was going to go to Jerusalem is he was going to deliver funds that he collected in his Gentile mission. And then from Jerusalem, he was going to sail off, and essentially that's exactly what he did. He went from Jerusalem, and he sailed all the way to Rome. This is the thing. Rome wasn't the final destination in Paul's mind. You know where he was actually trying to get into? He would, somebody said it over here. He was trying to get into Spain. And in the letter to the Romans, he actually mentioned Spain twice. He says, by the way, I'm planning to go to Spain. Because he wanted to establish evangelistic work in Spain because there was nothing going on in Spain. So he says, I'm going to make a pit stop in Rome and then I'm going to continue on to Spain. But we know the history. He never made it to Spain. Because in Rome, he was executed by a wicked emperor named Nero, which you could read. I won't get into the graphic stuff that he was doing in Rome, but he was a wicked emperor. So this is the background to Rome. This is the background kind of, so you have an idea of what is going on. Rome was the capital of civilization, the capital of culture. It was like the New York City. It would be our New York City. So it's like Paul's letter to the, to the New Yorkers, right? To all the believers in the New Yorkers. It was an important city, and the idea was that Paul was a networker, and he wanted to get involved in being influential with highly trendy people. And that's why he directed his attention on cities, because that's where the people were. And if you remember carefully in the book of Acts, there was a, po a politician that came to Christ. So he was reaching everybody, high and low. And that's what Paul was all about. So he's writing the letter to the Romans. And if you have your Bibles, we can begin to look at the introduction, because unfortunately, because of our time, we won't be able to go into an exhaustive uh, exposition of the entire chapter but let's look carefully we're gonna we're just trying to understand the background romans chapter one if you have your bibles we're gonna take a look at what paul is dealing with to the letter in the letter of the romans and remember this was a letter in today's terms we could say it was an email amen so at the end of the day it wasn't a book that he was trying to publish so that it could be sold in the christian bookstores that's not the point. It was a letter. It was communication. He was trying to communicate his faith and his uh, uh, wisdom to a church that was in a very, very hostile area because Rome was extremely pagan and extremely hedonistic. How does the church flourish and thrive? Well, that's what Romans is all about. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, when you're there, please say amen. And let's take a look. We're going to look at just the introduction. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated to the what? He separated to the gospel of God. Now, in the entire chapter, chapter 1, Paul mentions the gospel four times. This is an important word for us to understand if we want to be in the loop with the book of Romans. Okay, the word gospel comes from the word euangelion, which in Spanish it actually is very similar, evangelio, right? which in the English is where we get the word evangelism. Isn't that interesting? And what it means is actually good news or glad tidings. That's really the more accurate. When, remember when the angel appeared, right? I bring you great news or glad tidings. That's what really the gospel is. It's good news. So really evangelism is good news-ism. Are you comfortable with that? That's what evangelism is, good newsism. Now, why do I say that? Because if we carefully uh, diagnose our preaching, our Bible studies, our teaching, our instruction, even our interaction with people, many times what we're giving to them is not good news, it's bad news. It's bad news. It's like, oh, great. Thanks. People realize that, you know, Jesus is coming soon, and that's going to mark the end of the world. They're like, whoa. Whoa. Man, that's, I, what am I going to do? You know, you know what I mean? So all I'm saying is that we have to be balanced. Good news is joyful. Hey, guess what? I got great news. What is it? That's what the gospel is. <laughs> it's good news. So the way that we should communicate it is, hey, optimism, positivity. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we don't address issues and that we don't give bad news. Of course, there's bad news involved. The wages of sin is death. That's bad news. But we don't just leave it there, amen? The wages of sin is death, bad news, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's good news. But if we, if we carefully assess and diagnose the way we do evangelism in church and preaching, you'll discover that a lot of what we do is we just give people bad news. And then they walk away from it, and then we blame them. Oh, he doesn't have enough faith. Not really. It's just that they need a little bit of encouragement. They need internal impetus to follow us because the gospel is an invitation, is it not? Say, hey, come here. Follow me. Follow you to what? What are we doing? That's what the gospel is rather than just, and of course, remember, that's not the issue, though. The, that issue is connected to the fundamental issue of what? Of legalism. Because if we have a legalistic framework, it's going to affect the way we do evangelism. It's going to be unappealing, and it's going to be people repellent. So Paul is separated to the good news of God, verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, verse 4, and declared... To be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's break that down. What in the world did Paul just say? First of all, he's saying that he has been separated to the gospel. He's been separated to the good news. Right? And then he gives us a little bit of the origin of the gospel. Because what is the gospel? It's good news about what? What is it? In verse 2, the apostle Paul connects the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Old Testament prophets. Do you see that? He says the gospel of God, which he promised where? Before, through his prophets to the Holy Scripture. In other words... The gospel is just as much present in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. Can you say amen? We have a lot of people who say, oh, brother, but I'm a New Testament Christian. Well, what's the New Testament based on? The Old Testament. And what we're going to discover as we go to the book of Romans is that Paul was avidly quoting from the Old Testament. That's what he, that, that's what he was building his teaching on, right? So he's saying that the gospel is what he was separated to. The gospel was promised through the Old Testament. Number three, and then this is where it gets really, really good. It gets really exciting. He says, the gospel concerns what? Concerning his son. Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. That's what, that's what Paul is explaining as to what the gospel is. That's the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? Verse 3, concerning a person. The good news of a person. Why is this important? Because if we're not, if we really realize, if we do a careful diagnosis and a self-evaluation, we will, many times the gospel to us is a list of theological beliefs, theological truths, doctrines, and teachings. Do not misunderstand. I'm not saying doctrines and teachings are bad. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that Paul here is saying that the gospel concerns not a list of rules. That's not what he says. He says it concerns his son, Jesus Christ. And then Paul begins to outline some, I love this, some of his son's accomplishments. In other words, Paul says that the gospel is about a person who has accomplished pretty amazing things. Well, what did he accomplish? Let's take a look at that. It says that he, first of all, was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. What was the accomplishment? He came to the world, and he was born as a human being. That's quite the accomplishment, right? God the Son came down and became human. 
Accomplishment number one. What else did he do? The Bible says in verse 4 that he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So wait a second. He was born a human, but he resurrected from the dead, from the tomb, which is a human problem. And then he says, through him we have received what? Grace. An apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Translation. The gospel is about an alien. Are you comfortable with that? Are you comfortable with that? The gospel is about an alien who has accomplished pretty amazing stuff. And we are the beneficiaries. The gospel is about an alien who has accomplished some pretty amazing stuff, and we are the beneficiaries. I'm going to say it one more time, just because it's kind of cool. The gospel is about an alien who has accomplished pretty amazing stuff, and we are the beneficiaries. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what the gospel, does that sound like good news? It sounds like amazing news. Where do I sign I want to be a part of this thing. That's what the good news is. Paul's saying, hey, guys, just a reminder. The gospel, by the way, is not a new fad, okay? <laughs> this is not a new thing that we've invented. No, 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 It's been promised where? Before. This is old school. Quite the contrary. This came before legalism was around. Amen? This is original. This is the foundation. And we're just bringing it back because it's been forgotten. The gospel is about a person and about his accomplishments, and we're the beneficiaries. Why is that amazing? Because it doesn't talk about what I need to do. Now, this is the problem that we have, and, 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 and I'll illustrate. As soon as we mention the gospel is about the person who accomplishes, and we're the beneficiary, and it's not about what I need to do, immediately we're like, immediately, immediately we're programmed to say what? Well, what about sanctification? Come on, admit it. Don't raise your hand, that's okay. Oh, but what about the law? What about obedience, right? That's the problem. Just because we're celebrating what Jesus has done, it doesn't mean that we're throwing obedience out the window. But because we're so careful about obedience, we don't want this obedience child to be hurt. We're more concerned about obedience than we are about the Son of God that has come down, taken a part into our human race, accomplished some epic stuff, rewrote history, came from the dead, and we're the beneficiaries. Why, should, why don't we emphasize that a little bit more? Amen? Justifi Thank you, Sonia. Justification. Now, some of you are thinking, well, this preacher has gone, gone off his rocker. What, what about sanctification? What about, what about uh, the obedience to the law? Ladies and gentlemen, that's coming. Amen? This is the introduction. It's coming. And by the way, by the way, sanctification. You know where you find a chapter in the book of Romans that is saturated with sanctification? Chapter 12. Let me translate that for you. Paul... <laughs> Before he hits sanctification, chapter 12, he has to set the groundwork in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. <sighs> Do we understand what justification is? Okay, now we're ready to talk about sanctification. <sighs> Do you, do you see the problem? Do you, do, you see, do you see the emphasis that he has on justification? The problem that we have is that we prematurely jump into sanctification without really dealing with the beauty and the marvel of justification. Once we are overwhelmed with justification, then we're ready to get into sanctification. But see, a lot of us are not overwhelmed. We've lost the charm. We've lost the marvel. It's become kind of boring. So because it's boring, then we need something tangible 
This is kind of, yeah, it's like old news. So we focus on what's tangible, which is what? Sanctification, works, obedience, because I can see it, I can feel it, I can touch it, I can smell it. But that sounds a lot like who? Unless I feel and touch. Sounds a lot like Thomas, doesn't it? This is the fundamental problem that we have. It's not a denomination thing. It's a human thing. Amen? All of us are in the same boat. We have an issue. What is our issue? The issue is that we are legalist by nature. That's our issue. Paul is prescribing some pretty amazing vitamins and nutrients to deal with the legalism issue. It's called the gospel. It's called the good news. And later on, we're going to discover it's called the righteousness of God that has been revealed and also it has been given to us. That's what the gospel is all about. I think that the outcome of this entire journey in the book of Romans is going to lead some pretty excited, excited people. I'm going to warn you guys. Well, I'm going to have to warn you guys. Every person that has carefully studied the book of Romans, the outcome is some pretty epic revival. Amen? Martin Luther was one of them. We could talk about John Wesley. We could talk about Augustine. We can talk about Jones and Wagner, which we're going to talk about later, pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Whenever you deal with the book of Romans, you deal with some pretty amazing outcomes. My desire is that the Lord can rewire me and that I may be excited about the fact that even though I am a sinner, even though I am by nature disobedient, that the good news of what he has done and what he is will transform me. How about you? How many of you want to say, Lord, give me some of this good news because my home is full of bad news? How many of you want to say, Lord, give me some of this good news because CNN is driving me crazy? CNN.com, negativity. I go on Facebook, negativity. I'm pretty sick of negativity. Amen? It's high time for us to come back to the gospel, to the good news, to the message of, hey, this world stinks, but it only gets better. If this is your desire and you want to experience that, I invite you to stand to your feet right now as we sing our closing hymn, 4112, 412, excuse me, Cover With His Life. Sinless is he, Father, impute his life unto me, my life of scarlet, my sin and woe, covered with his life, whiter than snow, covered with his life, whiter Shall I know my life of scarlet, my sin and woe, covered with his life, whiter than snow? Deep are the wounds, transgressions is made, red are the stains, my the 
wanted to remind that if there's anybody that is in need of prayer, if anybody is, has burdens or something that's really, really just uh, you need mentoring, you need prayer, you need attention, you need guidance, we want to encourage you to join Dr. Bob and some others as they're going to be having a prayer service right here to my right, your left, and then as they go in, people will, you'll be going to different places where you could have one-on-one time uh, in prayer and an opportunity where you could come and just really lay your burdens on Calvary. Also, just a reminder that there's a fellowship luncheon. And we're actually going to have the blessing on the meal now so that that way everybody can go ahead and begin. Let's bow our heads. Father, we are so incredibly thankful that we are saturated with good news. Amen. In the midst of a world that is dying, in the midst of a world that is in constant paranoia. Because they have no idea what tomorrow holds. Father, you tell us that the best is yet to come. We're in this world, Lord. We're saturated with negativity. We can use a couple of dosages of the gospel. And this morning, Father, as we have heard the gospel, we pray that your gospel may do its work of transformation, that your gospel may rewire our brains so that we can see the beauty and the majesty of God and so that we can see the glorious salvation that he has purchased on our behalf. Help us, O Lord, to experience awe, to experience wonder, and to experience being without words. Because then, and only then, will we truly worship. And this is our prayer because we ask it in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. God bless.